page 43. It is, however, to be admitted that the treatment of the character of Isabella does not elicit a satisfactory response from the audience. It is not a very convincing portraiture. The reason is that Marlowe has compressed the events of long 23 years into a small space of time. Within the apparent time limits of the play, the change has not been shown convincingly. Yet we agree with less sorry with lees that quote allowing for a little exaggeration at the end we have to admit it is a melancholy possibility unquote question 45 sketch the character of queen isabella show how she undergoes a change in the course of the development of the drama is this change abrupt or is it adequately prepared this is from CU Honours Paper 2000. Answer. C. Question 2. Sorry. C. Answer to question 44. Question 46. Discuss the inconsistency in Marlowe's representation of the character of Queen Isabella. Can you suggest an adequate explanation for it? Answer. C. Answer to question 44. Question 47. Illustrate from Marlowe's treatment of the character of Isabella that, quote, the queen is a split personality, unquote. Answer. See answer to question 44. Question 48. Sketch the character of Gaveston. What part does he play in the drama? Is the character true to history? This is from CU Honours Paper 2001. Answer. Gaveston is Edward's minion, M-I-N-I-O-N. Edward refers to Gaveston as his minion. Quote, Were he a peasant, being my minion, I'll make the proudest of you stoop to him. This is Act 1, Scene 4, Lines 30-31. But when Isabella says that, Quote, the king is lovesick for his minion. Act 1, scene 4, lines 87. Unquote. It carries all the overtones of contempt it was accumulating in the 16th century. Gaveston is an ambitious careerist. For his own goal, Gaveston sets out with a practical modification of Tambourine's program. Quote, what greater bliss can happen to Gaveston? Then live and be the favorite of a king. Unquote. His ambition is akin to that of the middle class man of Tudor, England. The career of Wolsey, W O L S E Y, has given both a fearful warning and an encouraging example. His boastings are merely insolent and his bravado peevish and unimpressive. Quote, whose moaning Thoughts did never creep so low, next line, as to bestow a look on such as you. Unquote. Gaveston hates the English nobles. He is a Frenchman and openly hates the English barons. This explains this explains the antagonism between Gaveston and the barons. Mortimer says, quote, I have not seen a dapper jack so brisk. He wears a short Italian hooded cloak. Unquote. He has a Frenchman's dislike of London and its citizens and a contempt for the English nobles, whom he annoys with his foreign fashions and airs. He hates the ordinary people. His treatment of the three suitors who wish to be attached to him as servants speak of his unsympathetic nature. An ambitious careerist as he is, he is contemptuous of the ordinary people. A Machiavellian self-seeker, he is proud and insolent. He intends to manipulate the pliant king as he chooses. Page 44 He is cruel he is crafty enough to keep his hold on the king's affections by inventing amusements after his liking. 
he ponders the plan of keeping the king engaged in frivolities. Quote, I must have wanton poets, pleasant wits, musicians that with touching of a string may draw the pliant king which way I please. Act 1, Scene 1, Lines 51 to 53. Lees points out, L W E S. Lees points out that, quote, Gaveston bears the work of his creator, Marlowe, both in his sensual and luxuriant imagination and his devil may care insolence, unquote. By a daring anachronism, Marlowe gives to Gaveston an excess of those aspirations of the Renaissance which he himself dreamt of in the reckless enjoyment of the life. The amusements he arranges speak of his love of art. Again, his love of the king is sincere. When he is caught by the barons and sure death awaits him, he is eager to have a last sight of the king. Quote, Renowned Edward, how thy name revives poor Gaveston. Act 2, Scene 5, Lines 41-42 his joy to see Edward overcomes the bitterness of captivity and the imminence of an ignoble death. Sweet Sovereign, yet I come to see thee ere I die. Act 2, Scene 5, Lines 94-95 Edward also loves Gaveston. When Mortimer asks, Why should you love him whom the world hates so? Edward replies, quote, Because he loves me more than all the world. Unquote. Some critics believe that Edward is pathetically deluded in his estimation of Gaveston. Douglas Cole, C-O-L-E, for instance, sees the Frenchman as a flattering opportunist. But Gaveston's attachment to the king cannot be denied. Roma Gill, G-I-L-L, suggests that Gaveston is the stronger character and Edward relies on him for support in his own weakness. Marlowe, however, secures sympathy for Gaveston. He is humiliated and disgraced. The middle class careerist is shunted here and there at the will of the powers that be. Quote, My lord, I hear it whispered everywhere that I am banished and must fly the land. Unquote. In the end, he suffers the indignity of Mortimer's jibes, Pembroke's coldness and Warwick's treachery. But he remains unreconciled to the end. Warwick suggests that he will be beheaded instead of being hanged to death as an ordinary man. Gaveston thanks the nobles and says, That heading is one and hanging is the other and death is all. Gaveston plays a very significant role in the drama. As a matter of fact, the complications of the plot issue from him. It is for him that the king is alienated from the barons, from his queen, from his commons and others. The infatuation of the king for him is such that he is ready to divide the kingdom among the barons, only if he is left a corner where he may frolic with his dearest Gaveston. The queen's sufferings, the enmity of the barons are all due to his attachment to the king. He is banished a second time by the compulsion of the barons. Again he is recalled on the persuasion of the queen. His bold defiance of the noble infuriates them, who hurl abuses on him and stab him. The king is led to war with the barons. Thus, the king's infatuation for Gaveston leads to the bitterness of the nobles and the sadness of the queen. The conflict of the drama hinges on the relationship of Gaveston with the king. Page 45 Gaveston is a historical character. He is Edward's, Edward II's favourite. The banishment of Gaveston in 1308 and his recall in 1309 are also in proper order. His second banishment to Flanders in 1311 and recall in 1312 are omitted. Gaveston, after his return from exile, came into clash with the barons in 1312. The baron set out to capture Gaveston when Kent joins the barons. Thus, Marlow is more or less faithful to history in the presentation of Gaveston's career. But Gaveston's deep love for the king, his ambition, his love of art, 
are all Marlowe's inventions for the sake of the drama. Marlowe has invested Gaveston with the reckless abandon, defiance of the nobles and the craftiness of the ambitious careerist. Page four, sorry. Question 49. Quote, Among the friends of Edward II, Gaveston is the dominating figure and is made to play disproportionately important part. Unquote. Discuss. Answer. See answer to question 48. Question 50. Sketch the character of Kent. How far is it true to history? Answer. Kent's function in the play Edward II has been described by Mr. Levin, L-E-V-I-N. Quote, Amid these bewildering shifts of moral winds, Kent is a sort of weather vane whose turnings veer with the rectitude of the situation, not unlike his namesake in King Lear. Unquote. Kent attracts the readers by his courage and considerateness and at the same time moderation in his speech and conduct. At first he is on the side of his brother Edward against the haughty barons who are defiant and insolent. He chides the barons for their violent attitude to the king. Quote, Is this the duty that you owe your king? Unquote. When Mortimer threatens Edward on the question of the money of for his uncle's ransom, it is Kent who gently chastises the impetuous Mortimer. Quote, what Mortimer? You will not threaten him. Quote, unquote. He is loyal to his brother, yet protests against the extravagant titles loaded on Gaveston. Brother, the least of these may well suffice for one of greater birth than Gaveston. Act 1, Scene 1, Lines 157-58 his eventual defection from Edward shows the extent to which the king is to be condemned. He advises Edward to renounce Gaveston when he sees that the favourite will be the ruin of the king and the realm. In this he is wise and disinterested. He realises the folly of Edward in antagonising the barons and cherishing flatterers. In a soliloquy he calls Edward, quote, unnatural king to slaughter noblemen and cherish flatterers. Unquote. Yet he recognizes the evil of rebellion and in support of the lawful king is the mouthpiece for of some fundamental orthodoxy as he invokes God. Quote, to whom in justice it belongs to punish this unnatural revolt. Act 4, Scene 5, Lines 17-18 he joins the party of Isabella and Mortimer and is in the army which attacks Bristol to get hold of the king. He is anxious for the fate of the king. He retains his moral sense when all around him are losing their moral sense and his clear-sightedness tells him that Isabella and Mortimer, quote, do dissemble, unquote. He exercises a good influence over the prince. He makes an attempt to save Edward from Kenilworth Castle, but is repelled by the guards. He boldly asserts that Edward is still the King of England. He is killed at the behest of Mortimer. At the behest of Mortimer. J. B. Steen, S. T. E. A. N. E., describes Kent as quote, a choric weathercock, unquote. but he comments that his Councils of moderation are timidly and ineffectually professed. When Mortimer is talking of war, Kent merely observes sadly that it would be better if, quote, all were well and Edward well reclaimed, unquote. He is still more timid when sounding the Queen. Quote, Madam, without offence, if I may ask, how will you deal with Edward in his fall? Unquote. Page 46 The prince implies a reproach in his subsequent query and Kent admits, quote, I dare not call him king. 
unquote. Nevertheless, it must be said that Kent is a solitary figure. He joins the rebels through a mistaken sense of duty to the state. His heart and his orthodox conscience belong to the king. A critic has rightly observed, quote, Kent is the one character in the play upon whom the affections can rest. The one character, apart from young Prince Edward, whose concern for the king is wholly untouched by jealousy, hatred, lust or self-aggrandizement. Unquote. The Earl of Kent is half-brother of King Edward, but the role that Marlowe gives to him in the play is unhistorical. His appearance among the barons in the early part of the play is Marlowe's invention because Kent at the time, that is in 1312, was a boy of six only. He went over to the enemies of the king as late as 1326. Marlowe makes him a young man who takes part in the political turmoil of the time. He makes him, as Dean observes, quote, a choric weathercock. He marks the direction of the wind of political situation and as Rama Gill, sorry, as Roma Gill suggests, he is successful. Question 51. The only character to combine humanity with strength is the prince. Unquote. Do you agree? Give reasons for your answer. Answer. This observation of J.B. Steen about the character of Prince Edward is a correct one. He is full of natural affections for his parents. His faith in the right of and power of his father is unshakable. Quote, I think King Edward will outrun us all. Act 4, Scene 2, Line 68 But what is more attractive in his character is his confidence in himself. When he is asked to go to France with his mother on a political mission, he says, in a bold and confident manner. And fear not, Lord and Father, heaven's great beams on Atlas's shoulder shall not lie more safe, then shall your charge committed to my trust. This is from Act 1, Scene 2, Line 76-78. He evinces great anxiety for the security of his father. When the king is forced to fly from Bristol, he cannot be easily persuaded to wear the crown. His attachment to his uncle, Kent, is another attractive and human side of his character. He would be under the guardianship of his uncle rather than under that of Mortimer, whom he instinctively feels to be a bad man. Help, Uncle Kent, Mortimer will wrong me. This is within quotes. His courage and strength are fully revealed towards the end when he comes to know that his father has been killed by the machination of Mortimer. He orders immediate execution of the villain. He acts in a decisive and determined manner, quite unlike his father, whose weakness and vacillation and irresponsibility have caused his sufferings. He provides a hint of better things to come and a marked contrast with the presentation of an essentially decadent age. Question 52 Critics have very often discovered a conflict, both external and internal, in the tragedies of the Elizabethan period. Do you find any such conflict in Edward II? Conflict is the essence of the drama. In Marlowe's earlier tragedies, there is no external conflict. The Superman heroes face no outside conflict. No outward forces are arrayed against them. They suffer not for any external forces pitted against them, not for any fatal flaw in their characters. They suffer by the mere overweening feature of their ambition or greed or for the reaction to their excesses. Page 47 in Elizabethan tragedies, particularly in Shakespearean tragedies, conflict, both external and internal, is the most arresting feature. Macbeth confronts the conflict mobilized against him by Macduff. Hamlet faces the external conflict posed to him by Laertes and Claudius. The conflict between the Montagues and Capulets is the external conflict in Romeo and Juliet. In Edward II, the conflict between Edward II and the rebellious nobles form the center of the drama. As a matter of fact, Marlowe shows in the drama his skillful art in grouping the characters for confrontation. The nobles are infuriated 
with the king and are driven to revolt against him on the question of the banishment of Gaveston. The king has to wage a relentless battle against the barons and ultimately he yields up the crown. The quarrel with the barons, his war against them, his sufferings and humiliations and his ultimate disgrace and death constitute the plot of the drama. The characters are grouped as friends and opponents of the king. Thus, Edward II is built on an exciting and protracted, protracted external conflict. But the most important and interesting feature of a tragedy is the inner conflict of the tragic hero. As for example, in Shakespearean tragedy, there is the spectacle of soul divided against itself, a heart torn by conflicting in impulses. The tragic heroes of Shakespeare find themselves in an impossible situation. Hamlet cannot adjust himself to the decadent atmosphere of his time. Othello comes to find Desdemona faithless. It is a situation too terrible for him. They are perplexed in the extreme. Their, quote, state of man, like to a little kingdom, suffers the nature of an insurrection, unquote. In Julius Caesar, there is the external conflict between the imperial forces and the republican ideals. But in addition to that, there is the spectacle of the strife within the souls of Brutus between his duty to the country and his duty to his friend. The sight of the schism in the soul, S-C-H-I-S-M, in the soul adds to the poignancy of the tragic impression. In Macbeth, Shakespeare exhibits the theatre of Macbeth's soul where there is a tug of war between impulses to good and impulses to evil. Marlowe suggests in Dr. Faustus this conflict which is incarnated through good angels and bad angels. In Edward II, Marlowe attempts to show the conflict between the king's wishes as a man and his duties as a monarch. As a man, he loves Gaveston, is infatuated with him. He longs for a corner where he can frolic with his dearest Gaveston. He is not fit as a king. He is worthy of a private life of pleasure. Make several kingdoms of this monarch and share it equally amongst in all. Act 1, scene 4, line 70-72. Further, he says to the nobles, quote, Ere my sweet Gaveston shall part from me, this isle shall fleet upon the ocean. Act 1, scene 4, lines 48-49. Thus, he is an emblem of the human need for love. He says naively to Mortimer Jr. in reply to this question, why he loves him more, uh, whom the world hates. Why he loves him, whom the world hates. Quote, because he loves me more than all the world, unquote. Thus, Edward II longs for the sweet friendship of his favourite, and for the life of pleasure and pastimes. This private desire of the man comes into conflict with his duties of kingship, which sits ill on him. As a matter of fact, he is ill-equipped as a king. He illustrates the defects of the hereditary kingship. He cannot rule the kingdom. He antagonized the powerful barons on whose strength he has to depend as a king. His incompetence recoils on him and he complains in despairing self-pity. Quote, My nobles rule. I bear the name of king. I wear the crown but am controlled by them. Unquote. Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 28-29